Hello, this is Dr. Ira Jacobson from NYU Langone Health and the NYU School of Medicine in New York, New York. Welcome to this educational activity, which aims to provide a unique visual update on best practices associated with HCV screening and diagnosis, as well as how to integrate current evidence and recommendations into individualized treatment plans for HCV-infected patients. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled HCV from Screening to Cure, a closer look at changing at-risk populations and an evolving treatment landscape. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash FNC. Downloadable infographics and other materials are also available. On a societal scale, hepatitis C has become more of a public health challenge and a healthcare delivery challenge than an ongoing scientific problem. Given the remarkable evolution of highly effective and safe therapies, we really now face the challenge of identifying still a large number of HCV-infected people and linking them to treatment. If we look at the prevalence of HCV infection in the United States, it's been estimated by various sources that there are anywhere from 2.5 to 5 million people living with chronic HCV infection in this country, of whom up to half are still believed to be unaware of their infections. One of the problems with these estimate figures for the prevalence of hepatitis C in the United States is that the kinds of surveys like NHANES on which these figures are based often don't include or underestimate people to whom these surveys have much less access, like homeless or incarcerated people, veterans, people in the active military, and well, probably to a lesser extent in terms of inaccessibility, healthcare workers who may have a somewhat higher prevalence of the disease. You can see the conservative and upper limit estimates of the number of HCV cases and the distinction between who may and may not be included in the NHANES survey. Suffice it to say, once again, that we've got a big challenge ahead of us in terms of addressing this major public health issue by identifying patients and linking them to care. It is true that the number of cases of acute HCV infection in the United States has plummeted from very high numbers before we even had tests to screen our blood supply, for example, and that's been an important development. But the incidence has fluctuated and does remain much higher than it should be. The estimates of nearly 34,000 new HCV infections in 2015, which represents itself a nearly threefold increase since 2010 and is subject to underreporting, is still a very big number. So again, plenty of work to do, and the most ominous part of all this, to which I've already alluded briefly, is that largely in association with the tragic opioid epidemic right now, HCV infection rates have increased substantially among young adults. We can see that there are particular areas where the rates of new infections have increased dramatically. This is quite common, for example, in relatively rural areas as opposed to urban areas, although there's plenty of new hepatitis C also occurring in the latter. HCV infection related to injection drug use, although the numbers have gone up disturbingly amongst both non-urban and urban dwellers, you can see the numbers are more dramatic, both in terms of cases per 100,000 population and the rate at which the numbers are increasing for the non-urban population. Here we see quantified for us the concept that if you look at the percent of new people who inject drugs by race, it suggests fewer African Americans and more whites are starting to inject drugs. You can see that there is a big increase in heroin use in recent years, although another major culprit is fentanyl, which is a very potent opiate. We know that as complacent as it may be tempted to become because of advent of remarkably effective treatments, that HCV is still taking a huge toll in terms of morbidity and mortality. And I think it's completely under-recognized both in the lay population and even the medical community that HCV infection causes more deaths in the U.S. remarkably than 60 other infectious pathogens, including HIV. And this is illustrated with the curve for hepatitis C-related death going up quite clearly in recent years through 2013, while the risk of death from other infectious conditions, such as important ones like HIV, tuberculosis, and MRSA, have trended downward. About 75% of adults, despite competent immune systems, the absence of any immune deficiency disorders, do suffer from hepatitis C becoming chronic, taking hold in the liver. It's extremely rare for the virus to disappear. Patients become chronically viremic, potentially for the rest of their lives, in the absence of effective therapy. 
But we do know that the hepatic manifestations can vary dramatically, even in terms of the simple ALT levels, which can fluctuate up or down dramatically, as shown in the blue curve. But patients do fairly rapidly, within a few weeks to several months, become antibody positive, signified by the red line showing anti-HCV. And that antibody persists indefinitely. Very important for patients to understand that this is a type of antibody, unlike, for example, measles, mumps, or rubella antibody that you develop in response to vaccine, that does not confer neutralization, as the scientists call it, or protection from infection, but rather analogous to HIV antibody, which you don't want to have, signifies ongoing infection. Most patients, indeed, who have chronic hepatitis C have at least some degree of inflammation in the liver. It could be mild, it could be severe, or in between. But there is some necroinflammatory activity in almost all livers histologically if you do a biopsy in patients with chronic hepatitis C. And that, of course, stimulates the fibrotic or scarring process that can result in cirrhosis. The consequences of cirrhosis include hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC, end stage liver disease, possibility of portal hypertension with major internal bleeding resulting, and of course, the risk of death. It's estimated that once you have cirrhosis, 2 to 7% of patients per year suffer one or more of these terrible consequences. And just to focus on one of these for a moment, because it results in rather rigorously prescribed screening algorithms, is hepatocellular carcinoma, where the incidence in the literature is consistently reported as 2 to 4% per year in any patient with HCV cirrhosis. Now, there are all kinds of gaps in the care continuum, which is why I said this is as much of a social science issue as a medical science issue at the current time. Here we have a panoramic view on the left of all patients who we can hypothesize to be chronically HCV infected in the U.S. with 3.5 million. And if you go to those in whom the infection is diagnosed and whom patients are aware of their infections, you get a sharp decrease. As we mentioned, there are still many too many undiagnosed patients in this country. Not all of those have access to care, but many do. Not all even have an HCV RNA confirmed, and without that, you really can't do anything for these patients. Then we have smaller numbers still who've been prescribed treatment, and a very small number on the right is based on a recent estimate about four years ago of those who've actually been cured. We've known for many years that the medical community and our patients together have not done a very good job, and I think the medical community has to take some responsibility for this, of asking patients in various medical settings about risk factors for hepatitis C, like blood transfusions before 1992, or asking about past or present injection drug use. Really, a good medical history still requires that we get past our hesitations or busyness or worry about the stigma. If you ask patients if they've ever used IV drugs, and remember that it is part of a good medical history for all kinds of reasons, including the potential to identify patients with hepatitis C. But because of the widespread recognition that risk-based screening was not getting the job done of identifying many of these patients, the CDC in 2012 and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force in 2013 happily for all of us recommended birth cohort screening with a recommendation that everyone born between 1945 through 1965, because this group of birth cohort patients comprises about 70% of all U.S. patients with hepatitis C, should be screened on a one-time basis with no questions necessarily asked about risk factors. It doesn't mean you shouldn't screen patients in other age groups. And indeed, with the opioid epidemic lately and the increase in the incidence of hepatitis C in younger adults, there has been some rethinking of whether we should recommend universal one-time screening of all adults. But that hasn't been enshrined yet into any recommendation. We do know that screening of baby boomers could prevent HCV-related deaths, and what's very important to know is that there are actually scientific data in the form of three randomized controlled trials where researchers assess the probability of identifying undiagnosed HCV infection using a birth cord screening method, using three different methods at three different centers. And in all three trials, the interventions were considerably more effective, up to eight times more effective in one case, at identifying HCV cases compared to usual care. There are, of course, patient-related barriers to HCV screening, like a lack of awareness of who's at risk. Many of my patients consider themselves to be at no significant risk for HCV. Doctor, I never did anything like that. There's no reason to go into this any further, that type of thing. But new treatment options are also something that people are generally unaware of. 
if you're aware of the notion of universal curability, it probably helps you subscribe with your doctor or caregiver to the idea that, yes, you should be screened when that recommendation is made. And the concept of cure is very important to patients. Patients, even after rather lengthy explanations of what we accomplished with antiviral therapy, can still ask me at the end of an hour, but doctor, do you really cure this? And the answer happily is yes. We do believe, perhaps with a little hubris, but based on all kinds of scientific and empirical observations, this is a curable virus. There is the stigma problem. According to one study, over a third of people would rather admit to having a DUI than being infected with hepatitis C because of the connotations that a lot of people carry around in their heads about the relationship to drug use. And so we go to great efforts to be non-judgmental when we approach our patients and ask these kinds of questions. Provider-related barriers to HCV screening. A lot of colleagues are still unaware of the latest recommendations from the CDC and the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. The absence of outward symptoms of infection, many patients with chronic hepatitis C are asymptomatic, insufficient resources and time. Everybody knows that with the 15 minutes we're often given to see our patients in follow-up and some more time, but not necessarily that much more time for new patients these days. We've got plenty of other priorities, and there's no question that this contributes to the difficulties in identifying sufficient numbers of hep C patients. Sometimes it's a lack of understanding of the implications of a positive HCV antibody test. The unpleasantness of interferon treatment, which was quite toxic and sometimes overtly dangerous, caused major side effects, and certainly that still casts a little bit of a shadow over the history of patients with hepatitis C therapy that may affect, in some instances, the enthusiasm of doctors who may not know about the new treatments or patients who've heard about friends or relatives who had terrible experiences. Let's talk about HCV diagnostic tests. There are two basic tests. One consists of antibody assays, which reflect exposure to hepatitis C at some time in the past, often, as we've discussed earlier, denote ongoing infection. In fact, the majority of adults with HCV antibody do have the infection, but some don't. And that's why it's so important to understand about molecular HCV RNA tests, which are essential to confirm the presence of chronic viremia. There are two types of HCV RNA tests. One is qualitative HCV RNA, which frankly, nobody in my circles does, but it just tells you yes or no, the virus is there or not. The irony is that's the one that's FDA approved. All of us do quantitative HCV RNA assays, which are readily available. The quantitative assays are so sensitive nowadays that they're essentially just as good as the qualitative ones to get down to very low levels of detectability. So always get a quantitative viral load. Fortunately, many of our labs will now do a reflex test where if you check antibody, it will automatically do the viral load for you and immediately give you back all the information you need for the patient who then doesn't have to come back and get a separate test represented by the HCV RNA. So you do the antibody test, and if it's negative, it is such a sensitive test that if it's non-reactive, you're basically done. The only exception to that is in a patient who looks like they have acute viral hepatitis with the sudden onset of illness that may include jaundice for the first time or very high ALT and AST levels. And in those patients, it's important to understand the antibody may not be present as early as the virus, and you have to do a PCR. But in a patient with elevated liver tests on an insurance exam or a routine physical or being subjected to birth cohort screening, if that antibody is negative, you're done. And if the antibody is positive, you must always do an HCV RNA. I've already recommended that that be a quantitative HCV RNA. And if we go to the left here, to the green area, that is not detected. You can rejoice with the patient sitting in front of you that this patient does not have hepatitis C. It's extremely unusual for levels of viremia to go to below the radar of detectability on our PCR tests. Now, if the HCV RNA is positive, then you know that the patient has ongoing HCV infection, which is extremely unlikely to spontaneously resolve. There's really no such thing as waiting to see if patients clear their own hepatitis C. But the important point here, really, by far, is that you've now immediately identified a patient who should be linked to care. And I would add that you would want to get a hepatitis C genotype as well for the purpose of the consultant if you're not going to manage this patient yourself, because we still consider identification of the HCV strain or genotype to be important in formulating your management plans for patients. And here are some very useful pointers about communicating positive HCV antibody and positive RNA results to patients who are quite often distraught and sometimes afflicted with self-guilt and flagellation because of the risk factors that are associated very frequently with HCV infection. 
And you can really play a major role as a caregiver in getting patients over that by adopting a completely non-judgmental attitude, of course, being very supportive, explaining this is a very common problem. Regarding linkage to care, all patients identified with active hepatitis C infection in the form of viremia should be referred to a medical provider who can further handle this patient's HCV infection. It can be a hepatologist or gastroenterologist who has a particular interest in this. It could be a primary care clinician. Some of our primary care colleagues, particularly those who work in areas where hepatitis C is endemic and common, such as those in certain urban areas with a high prevalence of patients at risk, do a wonderful job taking care of their hepatitis C patients and actually often have considerable expertise in the management of very important subpopulation of patients who have both HCV and HIV co-infection. We certainly need to expand the net of care providers given the number of patients who can provide in a qualified manner care for hepatitis C patients. Here's a study which gets to exactly the point I've been making, generated a lot of attention at one of our international meetings, showing that whether you're looking at NPs or PAs on the one hand, or primary MDs or specialist MDs, the rates of successful treatment outcomes were essentially identical across all of those different groups of care providers, provided that they were well-trained to take care of these particular patients. Now let's talk about patient evaluation, treatment, and monitoring, and I'll make a couple of statements that are taken right from hcvguidelines.org. And if there's no other reference that we'd like you to know about, it's this one, which is filled with a wealth of information in the text, but even better, lots of easy-to-navigate tables that really succinctly summarize the expert panel from the American Liver Association and Infectious Disease Society of America that has convened for several years now to continue to make this the living, breathing, and valuable document that it is. The goal of treatment for hepatitis C infected persons is to reduce all cause mortality and liver related health adverse consequences, including end stage liver disease and HCC, by the achievement of virologic cure, as evidenced by the more technical term sustained virologic response, which we do think of as biologic cure in the case of this particular virus. Now, this may seem like a bold statement, but in fact, there's a wealth of literature showing that if you cure hepatitis C, you do reduce both all-cause mortality and liver-related mortality, as well as liver-related adverse outcomes like decompensated cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. The treatment is recommended for all patients with chronic HCV, except those with such a short life expectancy that treating their hepatitis C is not going to make any difference. The point is here that they turned away from a statement they made a couple of years ago that initially caused some inadvertent problems when they tried to prioritize access to HCV therapies for patients with more advanced fibrosis, and that created the unintended consequence of patients being denied by certain carriers access to therapy if they didn't have sufficiently advanced fibrosis. And that's why this statement reads most emphatically all patients with chronic HCV infection. We don't think there's really any such thing as an HCV patient who doesn't deserve to be treated with the available therapies nowadays. The initial evaluation of persons with chronic hepatitis C includes a thorough history. I do want to focus as a hepatologist on prior staging of liver fibrosis, that it's of critical importance to evaluate the patient's degree of scarring, even if you know you're almost certainly going to cure the patient, because it does affect sometimes what regimen you use, the duration of therapy, and most importantly, the present and ongoing future need for screening for liver cancer. Key aspect is the physical examination and the initial evaluation of persons with chronic hepatitis C. We all learned in medical school the various physical exam features, and you're familiar with those, but I'll let you look at those for a moment. And then I think the initial evaluation of patients' laboratory studies is important. All of my fellows and residents look immediately at the ALT and AST, but I look first at the serum albumin and the platelet count the level of globulins in the blood, because that gives me a better idea of whether the patient might indeed have more advanced liver disease. Indeed, any new patient of mine whose labs I look at as I say hello to the patient, or I see a low platelet count or a low albumin, I have to assume has cirrhosis till proven otherwise. An inverted ratio where the AST is higher than the ALT is a cruder but also sometimes useful preliminary indication that advanced fibrosis may have supervened. We have to do assays to detect other relevant co-infections. It's important to assess for hepatitis A antibody because of the universal recommendation that patients with any liver disease, not just hepatitis C, be afforded lifelong protection with a very simple and safe vaccine. We certainly want to check our patients for hepatitis B surface antigen to make sure we're not dealing with the occasional case of HPV co-infection. Check for surface antibody and core antibody. 
And many experts believe that all patients with hepatitis C should be screened for HIV because there are nuances to the HIV HCV co infected patient, such as drug drug interactions and the potential for liver disease to progress more rapidly. Again, we always have to make sure we have both the genotype and an HCV RNA level. Now, there are various things that we can do non invasively, short of poking a needle in somebody's liver to help stage their degree of liver fibrosis. We have the APRI score, which is a modified ratio of AST to platelets, something called FIB4, which you can plug into an online calculator that has four different parameters in it, such as the age of the patient and a couple of the biochemistries, and come out with a very quick idea of whether the patient is on one end of the spectrum or the other in terms of mild versus severe fibrosis. And there are some proprietary commercial tests like HEPA-score and FibroSure. They all use different combinations of either indirect markers like the platelet count, SGTT, SGOT, or direct markers related to the biologic fibrosing process. There's been a lot of heat but not too much light shed on which ones of these may be a little better than others. I think most of us get comfortable with one or two of them or sometimes settle for whatever our local lab does and generally combine that with something called elastography that I'll tell you about in a moment. And that has largely supplanted the need for liver biopsy in this always important goal of staging the patient's fibrosis before you go ahead and treat them. So we can use ultrasound just to look at the contour of the liver, but unfortunately, if the liver doesn't show a nodular contour or disproportionate enlargement of the left lobe, which are classic features of cirrhosis, it doesn't mean the patient doesn't have advanced fibrosis, though it's always nice to see. And we've developed in recent years something called transient ultrasound elastography. The most commonly used modality is called FibroScan. Some of you may be familiar with this or even have such a machine. It's a machine that wheels around on the floor of an exam room, can be moved from one room to another, and it's been a godsend basically for every hepatologist who has a large volume of liver patients by measuring the speed of sound wave transmission, get a very quick and reasonably accurate idea of whether the patient has mild, moderate, or advanced fibrosis. Now, magnetic resonance elastography is a very important modality because it actually is quite competitive with, and in some studies, somewhat superior in its predictive value for degree of fibrosis in various liver diseases, getting a lot of attention in fatty liver nowadays, compared to the ultrasound-based elastography techniques. And they're usually concordant, but not always. Here we see factors that predict response to therapy, like the genotype and the viral level, but now we have pan-genotypic regimens, so that's not quite as important as it used to be, and well, the viral level is occasionally important in selecting a regimen, far less so than it used to be. Amongst the host factors, the playing field has really been leveled amongst vastly different populations who used to have markedly disparate responses to interferon with ribavirin therapy back in the 90s and early 2000s. The one thing here that I think is still of some importance is the degree of hepatic fibrosis. We still have a slightly harder time, and it depends on the regimen and the patient population, curing patients with cirrhosis, particularly advanced cirrhosis, even though the SVR rates are up in the 90 plus percent range for all these populations. As you become familiar with managing patients with hepatitis C with our new direct-acting antiviral agents or DAAs, you must become familiar with the drug-drug interactions there are some that stand out more than others. Statins, for example, anticonvulsants, HIV protease inhibitors, and even proton pump inhibitors pose certain issues with certain drugs. Lidipasvir and velpatasvir, two so-called NS5A inhibitors that are very important elements in our therapeutic armamentarium nowadays, don't get absorbed as well if there's a non-acidic environment. They like acid, and there are precautions about the amount of PPIs that patients can take. Never embark on therapy in a patient with a certain regimen until you're sure that you've checked out the potential drug-drug interactions and made it whatever adjustments are necessary in the patient's medical regimen. There are all kinds of elements to assessing patient readiness for hepatitis C treatment. You do have to talk about whether there's alcohol or substance abuse going on, talk about family support, psychiatric stability, and of course, make some kind of a judgment as to whether you think the patient is likely to adhere to therapy or not, because with pure antiviral drugs, this is obviously of critical importance. Factors to consider when selecting therapy for individual patients include the genotype, the presence of cirrhosis, treatment experience, 
particularly with regard to the patients who've received interferon in the past. And there are still important considerations, despite the remarkably high success rates in these different populations, with a couple of exceptions across the patient populations that you see. So HIV, HCV, most important point is just as curable as everybody else, but you do have to know about the drug-drug interactions with the HIV medications. Decompensated cirrhotics seem to still need ribavirin. Recurrent HCV infection, post-liver transplantation, readily curable, just have to know about the drug-drug interactions again with the immunosuppressors that these patients take. Renal impairment, the most important consideration is that sofosbuvir, which is the only nucleotide polymerase inhibitor in clinical use, is the only class that's excreted through the kidneys. It accumulates, or at least its major metabolite does in renal failure, and it's not supposed to be used if the patient's GFR is less than 30 mils per minute. And of course, patients with ongoing risk for HCV infection, particularly reinfection if they're successfully treated, represented by injection drug users, are a particular population where I think collaboration with addiction medicine is always immensely helpful. But I will say that we've gone to a diametrically opposite position from what we used to adopt, which is don't treat these patients. Nowadays, it's actually considered very bad form to categorically deny access to antiviral therapy for patients who are injection drug users or certainly those who are on programs like methadone programs, and they do need to be treated. The success rates are very high in the appropriate settings, particularly involving collaboration with addiction medicine doctors, like I've said, and the reinfection rates, although not zero, are acceptably low in the literature so far. So let's talk about treatment of genotype 1 patients. Suffice it to say that we can see a variety of choices ranging from 8 to 12-week regimens in treatment-naive patients with genotype 1A who don't have cirrhosis. We have two 8-week regimens, and here you can see the only regimen where viral load is still important, and that's the commonly used regimen of ledipasvir and sofosbuvir. You can see another 8-week regimen, lecapavir and parentasvir, and the others are 12-week regimens. All of these regimens are considered to be of superb efficacy and are all in the frontline recommended list from the ASLD IDSA guidance document. All of them are perfectly acceptable. For genotype 1A patients with compensated cirrhosis, the previous group having been non-cirrhotics, we're down to four choices, and you'll immediately notice there were no eight-week options for cirrhotic patients. We think eight weeks is not enough to finish the job in cirrhotics, and why the so-called GP regimen shown in the second line is shown here for 12 weeks, as is with dipasvir sofosbuvir. Now, for genotype 1B patients without cirrhosis, you don't have that qualifier with the elbisphere grisopavir regimen because the resistant variants don't matter, even if they're present. And here you can see, again, a couple of eight-week options of the same nature that I showed you before, in addition to the excellent 12-week options that exist. But again, if you go to genotype 1B patients with compensated cirrhosis, all you see is 12 weeks. Here we can see the regimen of ledipasvir sofosbuvir in ion 1 and 3 in patients with genotype 1, showing very high rates of SVR, whether given for 8 weeks, 12 weeks, or 24 weeks. There are some stipulations in the recommendations for practical use, like the 8-week stipulation being good only for patients with genotype 1 who are treatment-naive, non-serotic, non-black, and non-HIV co-infected. There is an important stipulation here, and that is where it says variance in patients with virologic failure. These these are three of the polymorphisms that you can see, the L31, Y93, and Q30, that do confer decreased sensitivity to the NS5A component of this regimen, the lipiposphere. The patients who fail these regimens generally can be found to have in their viral populations post-failure the presence of one or more of these resistant variants, which has in the last several years generated enormous interest in how to retreat the few patients who fail these regimens. Here we see a more pangenotypic NS5A inhibitor called velpatasvir, also developed in a single co-formulated pill with sofosbuvir for 12 weeks in another famous study called ASTRA-1 for genotype 1 patients, and the remarkably high SVR rates and low relapse rates speak for themselves. Here's grisopravir and elbisphere, and here you can see the slight dip in the success rates in patients with genotype 1A. This is due to the fact that about 15% of patients with genotype 1A have certain baseline resistance polymorphisms to which you must test these patients because if you only give 12 weeks, as shown here, you do get that decrement in SVR and you have to compensate for that and can do so successfully by giving ribavirin and adding four weeks of therapy. But I've already given you my editorial comment that you may not want to do that if you can get some other regimen without ribavirin for the more commonly used duration of 12 weeks.
Here we see the impact of NS5A resistant variants on the efficacy of this regimen, once again, in non-serotic and serotic patients with HCV genotype 1. And it shows the same point about the presence of NS5A resistant variants conferring particularly a high degree of resistance to the Elbisphere, the NS5A inhibitor in this regimen. And the bar set on the right shows in particular the big toll taken if these resistant variants are present in the genotype 1A patient who gets this regimen without ribavirin for only 12 weeks. Genotype 2 has become extremely straightforward. It was always, for some mysterious reason, the easiest to cure with interferon and remains very easy to cure with one of the two top-line regimens, either eight weeks of glucaprevir, pabrentasvir, or 12 weeks of softbel in non-serotics, or 12 weeks of either regimen in serotics. Next, the ASTRAL-2 study showing the data set on which the approval of SOFL is based, it having shown superiority in this very important trial to the then prevailing standard of sofosbuvir and ribavirin. And here you can see the recommended regimen for genotype 3 patients, clocaprevir, parentasvir once again for 8 weeks, or SOFL for 12 weeks in the non-serotics and 12 weeks of either regimen with compensated cirrhosis. This shows the Surveyor 2 Part 3 study, which involved genotype 3 patients who received glucaprevir pabrentasvir combination therapy with cirrhosis and or prior treatment experience. And if you look at the right side, you can see that patients who were treatment experienced, whether without cirrhosis, shown in orange, or with cirrhosis, shown in green, had SVR rates of 95 and 96 percent, respectively. This is why the package insert for this product stipulates that for genotype 3 patients with treatment experience, with interferon therapy, previously who failed, even if they're not cirrhotic, and certainly if they are cirrhotic, should receive 16 weeks rather than 12 weeks of therapy, the only genotype that requires 16 weeks of therapy with this regimen. Here we see SOFL in genotype 3 patients with SVR 12 rates by cirrhosis and treatment history in the famous study in this particular genotype, appropriately called ASTRAL-3. And you can see little decrements in SVR rates as you go from non-serotics to serotics and treatment naive to treatment experience. Indeed, the ASLD recommends that if you're treatment experienced and have cirrhosis, kind of a double whammy, don't even bother doing the resistance test. Just give the ribavirin and be done with it to try to maximize the chance of SVR. I'll let you look at the treatment options for genotype 4, either without or with cirrhosis. Just know that there are plenty of options available, and the much less common genotypes 5 or 6 have plenty of options available as well. These are the ASLD recommended regimens for hepatitis C, and you can see that the most recent regimens are pangenotypic. They've been designed, particularly the NS5A inhibitors and the new protease inhibitors, voxelaprevir and glucaprevir, to cover all the genotypes with ingenious medicinal chemistry. Now, we haven't really talked at length about sofosbuvir, vilpatazvir, and voxelaprevir, but this is a newly approved triple regimen as of July 2017, which currently is approved in the United States only for patients who have failed a previous direct-acting antiviral regimen, which comprise a very important percentage of patients who do need extra help. So that regimen is an interferon-free, once-daily pangenotypic treatment evaluated in the Polaris trials and high cure rates in patients with prior DA failure. It's an excellent genotype 3 regimen, but again, not FDA approved specifically for that population as opposed to the patients with DA treatment failure because the SOFL was competitive with it. Excellent for cirrhosis and or unfavorable resistance profiles. Really a very impressive triple regimen, but bear in mind once again what I said about the approval being limited at the present time to patients with prior DA treatment failure. The ASLD guidance document does have a couple of other suggested applications for the regimen that you are free to consult. The GP regimen, it should be noted, also pangenotypic. It's the one that has a role for eight weeks in patients who don't have cirrhosis across all genotypes. And it, too, is approved for 16 weeks for patients who have failed an NS5A inhibitor, and they are only for genotype 1. And finally, of course, adherence to HCV therapy is one of the most important predictors of HCV treatment outcome. You do have to assess after mastering all of the regimens and having ideas about which regimens to use in which patients, the very mundane but important issue of assessing potential adherence problems prior to DA treatment. And we do find that free and open communication and constant accessibility is critical in the management of these patients.
Now, recommended follow-up after hepatitis C treatment, or what I like to ask or frame as the question, how much care do the cured need? Well, the answer is, as I've already alluded to earlier, if they have advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis, they need ongoing surveillance for liver cancer, the risk of which drops by about 80%. But 80% is not 100%, and these patients with antecedent advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis do remain at increased risk of liver cancer. We have seen this many, many times in our practice. Many of my colleagues have as well. And again, you can save a life. I'll just put it that way. If you keep doing ultrasound or other imaging of your patients every six months, the alpha beta protein is optional, but the imaging is critical. We have not identified a point at which we're so confident the patient can't get liver cancer that that screening can stop. There are very few people in the field who currently advocate such a view. The last theme is the potential for hepatitis B to reactivate. When you treat hepatitis C with these new direct-acting treatments, this is based on a now famous report to the FDA safety database showing 29 patients, most of them from Japan, who had reactivation of latent hepatitis B infection, occasionally with very severe consequences like you can see with chemotherapy. If you ask most hepatologists, they rarely see this, but it has been reported sufficiently frequently now in other sources as well that we do have to pay attention all of these HCV regimens, that regardless of the regimen, it's not regimen dependent at all, that if you treat a patient who has hepatitis B surface antigen, even if they have no viral DNA in the blood, they do have a risk of reactivating and you have to either monitor those patients or give them antiviral therapy against hepatitis B. Even a few patients who have core antibody alone is the only sign that they ever had hepatitis B may have sufficient HBV DNA latent lying deep inside their liver cells in the form of what we always call the CCC DNA that can serve as a template for reactivation, just like with rituximab or certain potent kinds of chemotherapy. And we don't feel we have to prophylax those patients, but we do have to be very wary that such patients, if they manifest elevated liver tests during the course of therapy, promptly need to be checked for the reappearance of HPV DNA. So in conclusion, hepatitis C is an exceedingly common and important public health problem with ominous implications for many patients who are chronically infected. It is extraordinarily easy to identify by being aware of risk factors as well as the very important birth cohort recommendations. Linkage to care after diagnosis of the condition, which is easily confirmed with an HCV RNA test, is critical. We think that essentially all patients with hepatitis C fully deserve an opportunity for curative therapy. There are many excellent therapeutic options which have extraordinary safety and efficacy track records. We have to think of this infection as being essentially universally curable with appropriate treatment at this point. And it behooves those who take on the care of patients themselves, whether they be specialists or primary care doctors for whom there's certainly a role, to become familiar with the different therapeutic options. With that, this can be an extraordinarily gratifying experience for somebody like myself working in this field for over 30 years. There's nothing comparable to having the gratification at this point in my career of having my cured patients coming in, having this dark cloud lifted from their lives. Thank you for your attention today. We hope you've enjoyed it and gotten a lot of useful information out of it. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www dot peerview dot com forward slash fnc this activity is supported by an educational grant from gilead sciences incorporated this activity has been jointly provided by medical learning institute incorporated and pvi peerview institute for medical education